So where we left off last time was, you know, you've seen finite state machines in a previous embodiment um, of various embedded system classes, uh, but both the input and the output and the delay, all those things that, that make up the, the constituent state can all be functions. And in that way, uh, you can still have some of an abstraction, um, but uh, really explode the complexity. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just throw one disadvantage of a finite state machine, uh, a, a theoretical finite state machine. And that is how, do, how does a finite state machine remember anything? What is the memory, what is the memory uh, process If I want to remember something in a state machine, how do I do it? Because there's no global variables, okay? Yeah, you can have a global variable, in which case, do it that way. But if you don't have any global variables, you got inputs, outputs, dwell times, states. Your state is your memory. Yeah, your state. And so if I want to record the, the condition you know, a 250, an eight bit, an eight bit number, you know, essentially, if I have, you know, theoretically an eight bit number, I'm gonna have to have 256 states times whatever thing else I've got. So, yeah, so it's, um, you know, that's really its limitation. It's not, it's not, a, it's not essentially the right way to do things uh, to record a lot of information. Now, obviously, like I said, you can make a hybrid machine store the, store the data in a regular global. All right, uh, click, click, click. Okay, so um, those of you who took 445M will have seen that fuzzy logic was in the, yeah, it was in the book. It's not something, we used to do it as a lab. Uh, we don't do it anymore. Um, an interesting historical uh, uh, thing about fuzzy logic. 445L used to do fuzzy logic. And way back in the, whatever, 80s or 90s, uh, when we taught 445L with fuzzy logic, some, you know, brilliant young engineer came through, took it, eventually went to work for TxDOT and wrote, uh, have anybody driven on Mopac and looks at the, the toll lane in Mopac? Uh, you know, the, the, the new toll lane on Mopac has a toll which has weird numbers in it, like, you know, 61 cents or $2.45, you know, whatever, and it changes. Turns out the, um, I don't know what the inputs are or the, or the outputs, but the toll on the Mopac toll lane is written in fuzzy logic. Uh, but, it's another way to, uh, to sensor integrate. That's what we're doing here, sensor fuse. Uh, and you'll see uh, it fuses pretty much like the other two examples. Um, uh, but a fuzzy logic has state variables. Now, this is not the same as a finite state. Uh, in this context, a, um, a state variable is a real variable, okay? Like temperature, speed, humidity, whatever. Uh, like all control systems, you acquire those signals, uh, but the um, fuzzy logic process is to, uh, what they define crisp input uh, as the real inputs to the machine. Like I said, like speed, temperature, humidity, happiness, whatever, those uh, crisp inputs have units. And then the first stage is to convert those units into things you believe to be true. So in that way, um, it's, like a, it's like a state machine, uh, but you have multiple states. You can be both happy and hungry. You can be both fast and stuck. You can be both, you know, so a input membership set is a set of boolean, or not booleans, fuzzians, uh, a, set, a set of true falses that ensemble define your system, okay? Uh, and so it's fuzzy because true and false can be maybe. 
So zero is false and 255 is true in this particular implementation. Um, 128 means I don't know if it's true or false. Okay, it's unsure. Uh, and then the fuzzy logic is a set of rules. That's the, that's the abstraction. Uh, that's where we're going to fuse uh, inputs together, which have different units, because we saw with the central limit theorem or with the averaging, you can't add two numbers that have different units. So basically here we convert all the inputs to a common, to a common unit, which is zero to 255 dimensionless true false and then we can combine them with the and and ors etc and that's the fuzzy logic obviously it has to do something so it defuzzifies uh which converts it back to out the uh, values that are crisp in other words they have units and then we do the usual stuff we output to the system and control some actually all right so um the fuzzy logic is staged again the crisp input is a is a thing like uh, speed. Okay. So, uh, for instance, this, this guy here, this crisp, this crisp input is in rotations per second. Okay. It could be fixed point. It could be floating point. It don't matter. And then we're going to fuzzify it, uh, by converting that crisp in input into a set of fuzzy variables or fuzzy membership sets, um, which are a set of bully, a set of, 8-bit unsigned numbers, which tell you whether or not it's going slow or fast. Now, in this particular case, um, you can't be going both slow and fast. So uh, there are, uh, you know, if the, if the number is less than one, then you're going slow. If the number is bigger than nine, you're going fast. And if the number is going, if you're going at seven, that means, I don't know, it's somewhere between maybe fast and maybe not fast. Okay. Um, and so again, you have you we're going to be able to combine sensors together. So we have another sensor, which is the acceleration. Uh, and so if the acceleration is very negative or very positive, you're bumpy. In other words, it's shaking a lot. Uh, you have some sensors which may be uh, discrete. Okay, it's either on or off. In which case, you know, there's probably no maybe about it. Okay. Um, and that is once the bump sensor is hit, uh, once any of the bump sensors are hit, uh, some of the bump sensors are active. If, if the bump sensors read 3F, that means none of the bump sensors are hit. And again, so you don't have to have, it doesn't have to be a, um, a, a trapezoidal linear circuit. It can be, it can be discrete. Okay. Uh, and again, zero means not true 255 means true and then they're 250 you know uh whatever four value uh, shades of gray if you'd like between true and false uh, so that's the fuzzification stage we're going to set up a number of these we're going to collect our data in the usual way uh, create a set of input membership functions now ensemble they're all true or falses and ensemble it tells us the the condition of the machine. Is, is the input membership set equal to the precision of your fuzzy value? No, the input membership set, it's a set, right? So in this particular slide, uh, the set would include slow, fast, bumpy, some, none, and energized. Okay. Set in a mathematical set here, in this sense here means a list of things. Uh, and slow is an element of the input membership set. Okay. I thought if it was binary, then it might have somehow like converted one to one to the fuzzy value, but I guess it doesn't. No. It, yeah. Not, what I said was if you look at the crisp input bump, those are discrete, you know, true or false. I mean, you either hit the bump switch or you didn't. Um, so there's no, you know, the, 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 the conversion never hits 128. There's no bump switch that is ambiguous about whether or not it's pressed. Um, and, the, and, the, and the idea here is, is there are, like I said, uh, four different sensors all fused together to run this machine. And they all have different units. 
but once the once you convert it to slow, fast, bumpy, some, none, and energized, those uh, six things, those six membership sets, uh, all have the same units now. They all have zero to two fifty five, and so now we can combine them. Oops, went too far. So. Uh, a collision, again, okay, now uh, a fuzzy logic converts an input membership to an output membership set. So now we have some more fuzzy variables. Here, there's four more, collision, uh, two bumpy, stalled, and, okay, collision was twice. Okay, whatever. Um, okay, whatever. I, uh, just, I didn't mean to have two membership sets with the same name. That would not be good. Um, Um, and so it means what I mean, this is the abstraction, uh, fast is a true false. Are we going fast? Okay. Uh, and some is a true false. Are some of the, are some of the sensors, some bump sensors activated? And so in this particular collision means I've, that was going fast and now some of the switches are are pressed. Um, too bumpy, I don't know why you do, your interest is fast and bumpy. Uh, stalled uh, might be, uh, it's going slow, there's power in the machine, and none of the switches are pressed. Okay. Uh, and we're going to implement the and, uh, the fuzzy and with a minimum operation. Okay, so so they both have to be true. So if so, it sort of if you if you if you extrapolate it out to Boolean logic, uh, two fifty five is true and two fifty five is and zero is false, and the um, and is indeed the same as the in a Boolean sense, and is the same in fuzzy for the completely true and completely false, and or um, is the maximum. Okay, so uh, again, you could have your logic. Uh, now, some of the things aren't true. Okay, I'll show you. Okay, uh, and then the last stage is to uh, to do a um, to convert the output membership sets to actual crisp outputs. In this particular example, I've got three output membership sets: uh, a desire to go to lower the power to the motor, a desire to leave the power to the motor the same, and a desire to increase this, desire to, in, to increase the power. And now I'm going to use some sort of function which converts Booleans into something that's crisp again, like the duty cycle for the machine. Okay, so let's click this for a second. Escape, yeah, okay, stop sharing over here. Start sharing over here. Um, in your, if you've downloaded and unzipped the the MSP four thirty two code in Code Composer Studio for any of the labs, embedded in here in this uh, driver file in this driver um, folder, is a is a is a a, a simple starter set, if you'd like, for fuzzy logic. Uh, let me begin with the H file. Uh, the type def for a fuzzy variable is, is no more than just an unsigned 8-bit number. Um, uh, interesting uh, that you, if, you, if you wanted to implement a, a fuzzy not, um, okay, let's go to here, let's do the fuzzy not. If you wanted to implement a fuzzy knot, uh, you could do 55 minus um, uh, the, the input fuzzy. It sort of works. Um, you, the Morgan's laws now will, not, will now not work. Okay, so I'm warning you, they're not, you know, it's sort of like logic, but it's not the same as, as Boolean logic. Um, uh, and it's like I said, just the maximum. Uh, there's an and of three things. 
there's an or, which is the, I'm sorry, and is the minimum, or is the maximum. Uh, okay. And then embedded in here, if you remember those trapezoidal, remember those trapezoidal uh, fuzzification functions, uh, here's a set of fuzzifications um, that have the different possible shapes uh, for the conversion from a crisp input to an input membership set, um, depending upon which way the trapezoid's fitting. Uh, so this is, this is one that peaks in the center. Uh, this one has a right, a left and right curve to it. So this is actually the one that looks like a trapezoid. Uh, a, a, no, a parallelogram. Anyway, so. Uh, anyway, that's what I wanted to show you. It's, uh, I, you know, it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of a fun thing. You know, it's, uh, it's fun to say. Uh, it's not a bad thing to have in your toolbox. Uh, somewhere along the line, you might you might need one. Uh, let me do one more. Okay, this whole there were four um, sort of descriptions here in this PowerPoint of how to fuse data together that have different units. Okay. Uh, now, in all fairness, the I'm fusing two variables here in this example that have the same units. But you'll see mathematically they didn't have to. Um, are you sharing? And, yeah, question? Are, are you sharing? Oh, I'm not. Okay, no, I, uh, no, I'm not. Okay, come on. Sorry, back up. Uh, it looks beautiful to me. Right, sorry. Thank you. And I wasn't, but I should have been. Okay, all right. So, like I said, there are, um, there are uh, four things we did. The, um, the the central limit theorem where we basically averaged the different things together assuming they had the same units scaled by their uh, standard deviation the second was the finite state machine and we used we fused the inputs on the state transitions the third was fuzzy logic and the fourth one here is called performance map um, the the this particular example is to autonomous driving this is the 445m example uh, those of you who are in there, uh, you have two sensors, distance to the left, distance to the right um, uh, wall, and uh, you have uh, you have two inputs, the di and then you have two outputs. Uh, how fast should I go, and should I turn? Okay, what direction should I go? And so, what's illustrated here is the abstraction, sort of the general idea here that if I'm too close to both walls, you know, some sort of, you know, some sort of I'm passing or whatever. Uh, in this particular case, I want to go straight and slow. Now, maybe you want to go straight and fast. I don't know, it's your choice. But the point is, these two close and close are the inputs, straight and slow are the outputs, okay? And then there's a bunch of scenarios. Uh, now we could have some turning in there, but this case it's only got, um, and so I'm going to do a mapping, if you'd like, between the, the input variables. In this case, this map is going to be two-dimensional because I have two inputs, left and right. And it's going to have two maps, if you'd like, two outputs, which are going to be the speed and the, uh, and the direction. All right. So... I'm going to do some sort of planning stage about how I want this to behave. Now, uh, this might be completely theoretical, okay, in terms of uh, solving equations or whatever, uh, but what it looks like when we deploy a performance map, again, the idea is to fuse, right? If the idea is to fuse. And so in this particular case, I have two numbers the right distance, which goes from 100 to 500 millimeters, and the left distance, which goes from 100 to 500 millimeters. And then the, um, the output is the, the, the command I'm gonna send to the right PWM. Now, there's a left PWM as well. And again, so the left PWM and the right PWM ensemble will get the total speed and the direction. Um, and so I didn't necessarily plot, 
right? If this, if this is 400 different choices, and that's 400 different choices, that's whatever 160,000 different, uh, whatever, in a large number of, uh, of possibilities. I didn't necessarily plot them all, but I'm gonna solve for them all, okay? So I'm going to do a mathematical conversion. That's what it means to map. You're going to map one dimensioned, one dimensioned input. I mean, in this case, two dimensioned input into a dimensioned output. Okay. Now the mechanical engineers use this in torque to use these numbers here. If you look up performance map, you'll see this is for things like torque and speed. Okay. Um, and so, they, they're, they're describing the behavior of their control system in terms of the torque and the speed. And then again, what it is they want to do with it uh, as an output. Uh, and on this particular, in this particular picture, all I did was pick the, uh, I have one, two, three, four, five, uh, one, uh, three times three, I have nine different points. Uh, and all I did was a linear interpolation between those nine points. So uh, here's the here's the actual code. Um, again, the number of dimensions up here in this map uh, represent the number of inputs that I have. So the number of brackets here specify the number of inputs I'm going to fuse together. Okay. Um, then the the three in here just represents how much work I want to do to specify the, the prettiness of this conversion. The, the values in these maps represent the output I'm gonna, in this, particular, in this particular case, that I'm gonna drive to the right PWM and then a similar one for the left PWM. So you can see, for instance, 2000, 2000 is straight slow and 5000, 5000 is straight fast, okay? And 3000, 3000 would be straight, medium-ish, okay? Uh, and so it's a fairly fast, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly fast converter because I collect my input, right? I collect my two inputs. Uh, and then I perform a linear interpolation into this, into this map to determine my two outputs. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, oh yeah, my, my, my comment about my comment about uh, fuzzy logic is the same comment I'm going to make about um, the same comment I'm going to make about performance maps. Uh, if you if I gave you this, uh, how would you determine these two points? Let's just do one of these slow. How would you determine this point and that point? Wouldn't that just be a function of the know, but, input, like a piece well, know, But how do you determine the function, okay? This number right here is a one in this plot, and this number right here is a two, okay? But where do you, where's the one and the two come from? The tachometer? I know, but, no, but who drew the plot for you? A smart engineer who knows how this is. Yeah, you need a, okay. So embedded in this is your intuition. Okay. Uh, and so fuzzy logic is is good to deploy in a situation where you know the intuit you have an intuition. Um, like the guy on the toll lane in Mopac, he knows what it means to be busy, right? He knows what it means to be uh you know that the weather is bad or these are you know you're going to he knows when rush hour is okay and so uh somebody has to know what you know what 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 acceleration means i'm not bumpy what acceleration means i am bumpy okay and so if you took this ensemble of stuff, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 different knobs uh, in this plot that you can adjust. You with me? 14 different knobs. And so how do you adjust the knobs?
trial and error trial and error and it's a 14 dimension space just warning you it's a each knob is independent from the other knobs now there's some intuition here but that's a 14 this is not very complicated it's only 14 now how many knobs do i got over here Eighteen, sort of. Yeah, I got eighteen knobs. I get those are eighteen numbers that I'm going to tune. And that is actually um, that is a a true statement of both uh, fuzzy logic and performance maps is they require empirical tuning. Okay, um, if you took a control theory class and you do a PID controllers. Uh, you could theoretically determine your 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 you know your control uh, parameters your control um, uh, constants, uh, but with a PID controller, you, know, you probably got only got two knobs you're going to be controlling adjusting. Whereas here, this one's got 18 different knobs. Okay, just warning you. Uh, okay, so all right, what's next? Actuators and power. Any questions on 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 um, uh, fusing, yeah, you can take a whole class on it. You could do. You I had could. a quick question about back to the central limit theorem with fusing. I understand see. how we, with the central limit theorem, we can kind of fuse the same input of a single sensor. No, but I'm, does that I'm, 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 I'm fusing. Okay, so yeah, you're technically speaking, okay. You, you, they're identically distributed, right? Yeah. That is a, that is a, a, an assumption in the central limit there. But once I go to, once I go to multiple data from different sensors, uh, you cannot, you shall not expect them to be identically distributed. Yeah. But what do you do? That's where this comes in. How do you combine things? In other words, how would you take, uh, how would you take a, a, a distribution, take three different distributions and, and create and, and, more, and, and modify them so they have the same distribution? Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Now. That's what I'm doing here. Look at what, yeah. look at, uh, just look at, um, uh, just for a moment, just uh, yeah, ignore, yeah, ignore these two. Let me just make a mess here. What's the distribution of this? What's the shape of this probability density curve? Right? Where should we call it? Yeah, and compare it to the shape of this one. They have the same shape. Got it. I guess if you, I guess I am assuming they're all. But I, I assume they're all the same shape. All I'm doing is I'm scaling them to have the same standard deviation. Okay. Yeah, that, that, so yeah, I'm a little bit, it's a little bit fast and loose with the sensor limit theorem, but it motivates. So I guess the best way to say this one is it's motivated by the central limit theorem. Okay. Okay. I guess that makes more sense. And then my follow up question for this would be. In the fuzzy logic and in the performance mapping, I have a pretty good idea of what the output, like what I want to do with it. But if I just know that in the central limit theorem, the way that I've distributed it has, sorry, I'm making you jump around slides all the time, um, that I have some equal distribution, am I going to have to use my intuition then to make decisions based on that single number? Oh yeah, of course. And now I haven't, haven't done, there's no output here, right? This, all I'm doing is fusing the data. So again, yeah. um, the, it's just that the other ones, you know, just like, just like with the state, state machine, the fusing occurred um, here in the arrow that I had in my state machine. Uh, this particular state machine had outputs and so did the other two. I mean, obviously we're going to have to, I mean, I, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing, right? The internet of thing. It has to, if it doesn't do anything, it's useless. Okay. Um, and again, without talking about, you know, data science and 
large data thing. We're talking about uh, making decisions about should I turn the, you know, should I water the plant or should I flip a switch or whatever. Okay. Okay. Good. That was a good question. Any more for this one? All right. So I'm going to save it because I made a made a typo there. All right. Uh, about to save. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, the prerequisite is was 445L. I am not really. I'm. I will not test you on this slide. Um, so if you want to glass your eyes over on this, I will test you on the previous one because I I think that was fun. Um, and I may test you on the next one, but I will not test you on this one. It's just if you're going to make a um, you know, if you're going to make a, a machine that does something, you got to actuate. Okay. After you've made your decisions, you got to change something. Okay. So we're going to do solenoids and motors and steppers and servos and relays. And, um, the clickety clack. Uh, we use solenoids to turn off the water or, or just a valve or open, un unlock a door or whatever you use solenoid. Um, the I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pen. Uh, the the where's my pen? Okay, uh, I'll type it. I'll be fine. I'll type it. Uh, the key thing here in uh, in using a MOSFET is the gate source voltage has to be high enough. Um, if I have a, um, if I have a, um, uh, uh, format, font, uh, subscript, subscript. Mm. okay, if I have a MOSFET, I got, in order to activate it into, into, into full on mode, if I have a, a, tr if I have a, um, a transistor, a bipolar transistor, then I got to send in base current. So again, I'm not going to ask you on this, but uh, if you're, if you're, um, yeah, if, if you're doing this for a living, uh, that's the key thing you have to know to get this to work. But basically you're driving current through a load, which is uh, resistive, inductive, and has a, has a voltage to it. So, um, uh, okay, so what did I say? What was my fundamental? What was my fundamental mantra when it came to software uh, in this class? The most important thing about choosing a microprocessor was what? Does it have pre-existing libraries? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to say the same thing about hardware. Okay, for the same reason. Uh, don't be an idiot and try to design things from a transistor level, go ahead and buy one that's pre-made, okay? And so there are lots, this is, um, this is the one that's on the robot. Um, there's two of these on the robot for driving the differential drive robot. And it's an H bridge, those are MOSFETs. Uh, they can drive a lot of current. Um, and each motor, again, uh, is converts mechanical electrical to mechanical energy or mechanical energy back to electrical energy uh, and basically the um, the current either flows either this end channel is on and that end channel is on and that way current goes left or right or this one is on and that one is on and it goes right to left uh, and nowhere nowhere your software can never write anything here so stupid that this one and that one come on and the thing explodes, okay? Uh, that's your friend. So again, you're gonna um, control the direction um, with one of the pins and you're gonna, con that's, and you're gonna control the, um, the amount of power to the motor with a PWM. And again, the, the low level drivers, well, the, hard, the, 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 the hardware is on the robot and the, Low-level drivers are already written for you for using PWM. Um, 
how was this um, how is this beautiful? I mean, those of you that were in 445M will remember why PWM is completely awesome for controlling the delivered power to an external device. Doesn't burn off extra power. Oh, okay. No, that, he, he said, uh, doesn't burn off extra power. That's the beautiness of a MOSFET, okay? Uh, the gate, the drain source voltage here is very low, even at large currents. So uh, most of the energy delivered off of VM to ground goes through the coil. Yeah. But what about PWM? That's awesome. What, what physical parameter, what physical performance uh, parameter does PWM have a high of? And the answer is, anybody want to guess? Accuracy. Accuracy, accuracy is not true. Uh, well, the PWM is very accurate. In other words, fifty percent is uh, is yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll let the high. You can fine. You can you can have a high. You can, it's, it's got, uh, I'll, 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 get, I'll give you that. It is it is uh, very possible for you to produce fifty percent power. Okay. Uh, because it turns out for, for reasons that I don't fully understand, the voltage is constant and the current's constant. So the power delivered here is very close to the PWM uh, frequency, the PWM uh, parameter. But what it has is high precision. What do I mean by that? You can tune it to a really fine yeah, degree. I can, I can, in other words, if this is a 16-bit timer, I have 65,000 different uh, values I can deliver. Okay. So, yeah, there's a lot of choices is what that means. Uh, yeah, it's accurate as well. Although it's only accurate if you have constant voltage and constant current. All right, so I don't want to talk about stepper motors, except, you know, they have usefulness. Um, they are not, a, uh, if you want to do an open loop controller and you're willing to buy a big enough motor, um, stepper motors are good for setting the angle or setting the position. So they're used in printers and, and things where you want to go to 46 degrees and stay there. Uh, they're not for situations where you're spinning very fast and delivering torque at high speeds. They're low speed torques. In other words, they spend all of their energy not changing, keeping the, keeping the out. They use all their energy to stop the motor, okay? That's basically the idea of a stepper motor. And they go through steps, five, six, 10, nine, or whatever. There's, each one has a different kind of pattern. And just like out of the motors, it's got electromagnetic coils which generate electromagnets south and north, and in this particular case, permanent magnets north and south, and they line up and the thing moves. Um, but just like the, just like the DC motors, uh, we're gonna buy a stepper motor driver uh, that handles all of the interface, and the software's fairly simple. It just outputs five, six, 10, nine, five, six, 10, nine. Um, the stepper motors are like two different DC coils. So could have used the DRV 88, 38, 48, whatever the other one was. Uh, yeah, but there's lots of uh, stepper motor driver chips. Uh, again, you would probably not do it with discrete transistors. Uh, servos are also good for setting the angle. Um, they have their own controller built in. Uh, and in this case here, the control is software PWM. Uh, again, it's highly accurate, highly uh, precise. And depending upon the motor, of course, you, uh, in other words, if you wanna have it at 30 degrees, you send out a period 20 millisecond, 1.5 milliseconds high and 
you know, whatever, 18.5 milliseconds low, uh, uh, square wave to the control signal and the thing will drive it to 30 degrees. Uh, now you have you can have some continuous rotational servos where this parameter then just sets the speed. Um, my experience with servos is every time you change something uh, that it the because it is got an internal controller, it will drive a lot. It will require a lot of current to move, and therefore the line right here, this five volt line on the servo. Uh, will often go down to one or two volts uh, when you flip the controller. So if this five volt line is the same five volt line running your microcontroller, uh, you will find that every time the software changes the, the servo angle, the, the, so the computer will reset because the power line dropped down to one volt. So it's a good design to have, you have a separate regulator for the, for the servo. Uh, because it the instantaneous current here is are very large um, and generate a lot of noise on the power line. Uh, relays uh, either relays um, are either like LEDs, the solid state relays, or like motors. And again, you can turn stuff on and off with a relay. Yeah, you uh, you choose one by how much current you have to drive whether you're driving an AC load or a DC load, um, uh, lifetime and cost. Uh, solid state relays work for AC appliances and basically work forever. Um, they're not real, not, none of them are really fast. DC relays um, are, are used for DC signals. I'm sorry, electromagnetic relays are used for switching DC uh, sources, but you get like 10,000 switches and then you got to replace it. Um, um, brushless DC motor uh, fixes all the mistakes you had with the brushed motor and that is it removes the friction. There's no brush. Um, and so it uses a Hall effect sensor. Those are the same Hall effect sensors we did a couple of slides ago. Um, and this is one particular uh, one particular um, brushless motor with three different coils, A, B, C, and the current goes either from A to C or from A to B or from uh, you know C to B or from C to A or from uh, B to A or from B to C, six different phases. It's not a stepper motor. It's not open loop. It's closed loop. You have to, you, you don't just drive the phases. You have to sense the motor and then adjust the phases according to the, uh, to the, to where it is. So in the, how you control it is on top of these, you PWM it. So if you were to look at the A parameter, uh, you would PWM the A signal and PWM the B signal and PWM the C signal. And in that way, you, uh, you're controlling it. And this is the one where the rule really does satisfy. Don't try to do this with discrete logic by yourself or controller. Uh, but they're expensive, but they last a long time. They're very high speed, very low friction. They're very quiet. Um, you know, the, your, your drones use these motors, your, your, uh, you know, your drones. Okay, so, okay, so power, power. Any questions on actuators? Uh, all right, what am I doing? Okay, so we started, I guess, so, you know, good. Yeah, we can, we can do this. Good, if I finish this one, we can go on to the next chapter. Um, Since we're in a pandemic, I don't know how much this I expect you to embed into your projects. Uh, you probably at least do the theory of this in your project. Um, uh, to think about how it is you're going to manage your power. Uh, unless you do, you know, NFC. Uh, I don't expect you to energy harvest, uh, but you're probably going to store. I mean, you'll probably use a battery or something 
And you may not actually design the regulator, but I'm sure your device will have a regulator in it. Um, uh, uh, I got this equation, oops, come back here. I got this equation, let me just get rid of these for a second. X. To remind you up front that I'm going to play fast and loose with the word energy. Uh, if you if electrical energy is, you know, is power times time, uh, but we're also going to define energy sometimes as just current times time with the assumption that the voltage is constant. Okay, just warning you in advance. Uh, anybody know what this is? Supercapacitor? That's the supercapacitor, not a very big one. I've got some bigger ones coming up. All right, so um, uh, power management uh, is two stages. Uh, how do you plan and how do you optimize? Okay, so the first uh, is planning. And again, this is where the world uses the wrong definition. This is not energy. This, if, if, if the parameter is in amp hours, that's not joules, right? That's joules per volt or whatever. But because batteries are specified in amp hours, we're going to do this, uh, assuming a constant voltage. Um, we are going to uh, use the same equation. Other, it is the power budget right there. I... Uh, if you have an energy storage of E and you desired lifetime of T, uh, your average current has to be less than E over T. And that's just sort of a simple unit thing. Um, yeah, I'll warn you right ahead, this is not correct. And we'll see some slides later on that this is actually not correct. Uh, but this is a behavior of a system. You can see it only lasted three minutes. Um, uh, what's what shape is this curve? It it charged up to whatever four point seven volts, and then uh, one it in the, in the run mode it dropped. That's the voltage versus time plot. Exponential decay. It, it, almost okay. That's half of it. Okay, so I should re redo this, and call it the these behave yours, okay? And yes, the first is exponential. Okay? And it's exponential y. What 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 circuit has an exponential decay? Capacitors RC. That's yeah, RC. That's RC. But if you look very carefully, yeah, uh, it stops decaying. Asymptotic. Yeah, but if it were an RC circuit, it would be asymptotic to zero. Are you with me? I mean, an RC circuit. Um, RC circuit will um, will asymptotically drop to zero. This doesn't. It asymptotically drops to something else. So there's a regulator in this system, and once that regulator misses its dropout, the regulator no, no longer pushes current, and so it stops going. Okay. So uh, this is another super cap. All right. Um, but yeah. So. Basically, uh, in order to manage my power budget, okay, I need to know what the current is, okay? Uh, and so as I design and test things, um, I'm interested in the instantaneous current. 
Uh, but some of these currents are pretty low and I can't just use a current meter, okay? So I have to use a specially built instrument for measuring current in real time, right? So I'm gonna, this is a time dependent measurement of the current. So this is the, the way this thing is working. This is the, this is the standard, um, that's the power line, that's the power signal coming into my system that would normally be connected there, okay? But it goes through this 0.02 ohm resistor, which sucks up some of the energy, but produces a voltage. But now I'm going to, I am going to, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to display that, uh, amplify that, and display it on the scope or measure it other ways. The difficulty of this is where, if you think about, again, I'm not, uh, you know, if you're an analog circuit designer, okay, if this were a regular op amp, okay, uh, you would use a rail to rail op amp, right? But look at what, what voltage is right here. What voltage is right? I simply ignore the 10 ohm, 100 ohm resistors for a moment. What, what, what voltage is right here? Right, uh, can, you, can you see my curse, cursor? Right, what voltage is on plus VN? What volt? What voltage do you have on plus VN? Three point three volts. Three point three volts. What voltage you have on minus V uh, minus N? CC. Or yeah, the same, the, 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 these two voltages are virtually the same because this resistor is really tiny, and so both the inputs of this circuit are at the rail, okay? And so a normal rail-to-rail op-amp works sort of in the middle-ish, close to the rails, but we can't use our typical rail-to-rail op-amp here uh, we, because the inputs are, are, are very close to the positive rail. So this is called a current sense amplifier, which is, has a special design purpose for measuring the difference between two voltages that are very close to the rails, okay? That's what a current sense amplifier is. Um, this resistor is obviously chosen to produce the gain, okay? The second thing we're gonna do here, and that is these, you know, I don't know if you've used your ohmmeter, but 0.02 ohms is a small resistance, okay? And so the connections, the, the actual, solder joints, the actual connections that are in these wires are so delicate that we can't use a regular resistor. We're going to use a special, what's called a four terminal resistor. Uh, and because there will be resistance in this wire and in that wire, okay, we're going to use a four terminal resistance and pick off the middle two to measure um, uh, to measure the voltage difference. So anyway, it's called a four terminal shunt resistor. You'll see that in a, if you actually buy one of these things, uh, they'll have, the resistors don't have two leads, they have four leads. And that is to, re to remove the contact resistance or connecting up the resistor itself, okay? Uh, all right, so you're gonna see some measurements made with this in a moment. Um, this is a fun thing. This is sort of an obvious one. This list is, comes from, uh, this list comes from, uh, from the book. And so what are the, whatever, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different ways to reduce current. Okay. Uh, the first is buy a better sensor, buy a low current sensor. Okay. Um, the second and the same thing is we are, um, we could shut the power off to the sensor uh, as well as shut the power off to the actuator when we don't use it. So we'll see these things go in the sleep mode. And so if I can, if I wanna save power, I'm gonna shut the sensor power down. Okay. Um, again, and when you do lab, I don't care what your, what your numbers are. Okay, I am not looking at the chat. So if you chat something, don't chat something. Uh, unmute yourself and ask it. Sorry, I don't see the chat. Okay. Um, 
you'll see that uh, there will be a sampling rate, how fast you sample, and this will be true everywhere. If you, if you reduce the rate in which you collect data, you're obviously going to reduce current because if you can sleep longer, you can, you can save power. Um, uh, when you do lab, especially the first lab and the second lab, you should see that uh, radio strength um, was a big deal. And so we could, you could tune, uh, what are you giving up when you reduce the radio strength? Range and bandwidth. Range and bandwidth, right? You're going to have more errors, uh, and which means you're going to have to either, you know, uh, recover the data and go slower, or obviously going to go shorter distance. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting one. For, I think what they mean by frequency of communication, and that is uh, collect a bunch of data and either fuse it or reduce it or at least um, um, sort of <clears throat> uh, squeeze it together to, um, uh, <clears throat> and send out fewer, fewer packets. Um, and so you could keep the collection, the sampling rate the same, but have a, a send rate, which is slower, uh, especially, you know, if you can, um, you know, if you can, you can, uh, connect the data together. I'm looking for the word. Yeah, I'll call me. Um, oh, this next one is a three. Uh, I don't know if they did this in 306, uh, but I did it when I teach 319K. And that is, uh, um, can you, uh, you know about the, the, you know the general rule about the bus frequency on your, on your clock. All right, what can you tell me about the frequency of the microcontroller uh, fetching instructions to the current draw of the microcontroller? What's the relationship between bus frequency and power to the microcontroller? I mean, I think a higher bus frequency meant more power. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Duh, right? So you know what your cell phone does when it runs out of, you know, when it's getting close to the end of the battery, it goes in low power mode. What's that? Lower, lower frequency, okay? Um, but could you prove it? Okay, wait, what? Let me, let me go further. Do you know what that, what that equation is? If I have the frequency, what happens to the power? I think it's one of those things where you have your static power dissipation and then your dynamic power dissipation, and you'd be able to okay. have so I'm, the the yeah, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the static. Okay, but the dynamic power is what relationship to the frequency? I thought it was linear, like hmm. half frequency. Exactly. Now it's now okay. Fine. I'm I'm making a a gross overstate oversimplification. It's not perfectly linear, but it's approximately linear. Uh, could you prove it? That's why my circuit's here, to give you a, a way to prove it. And I'm still looking for my, well, maybe it's in the, hold on. I'm looking for my pen. Now you think about how you're gonna prove it. Okay. All right, let me, let's start with a simple equation, simple, uh, a simple analysis of this circuit. Assuming A is constant, right? It's either high or low. Right? It's not something stupid like one and a half volts. If A is high or low, where's their current? Well, we'll pick one. High. Don't matter. Either one. This guy's off, right? And this guy's on. Uh, and this guy's, you know, tied to some other gate somewhere, right? 
So where's the current flow? How, how can current go from here to there? Again. During the switch when. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, you're during the switch again. Okay, but not during the static time. Okay, so at this point here, okay, uh, the current, right? So if I were to, let's draw A as a function of time. Okay, and if I were to draw I also as a function of time, there's no current there. Okay, but when A goes low, this thing flips, right? That one goes on, this one goes off. And the current goes back to zero again. But as it goes through the switch, if this is one and a half volts, now what happens? Right? Remember the the the, the gate source voltage turns it on. And so at one and a half volts, you have one and a half volts here, and you have whatever one point. Okay, so 1.8 volts there across this gate source voltage, and they're both on. Uh, let me draw. Let me draw it with a circle. Okay, so at one and a half, you know, right, right here at this point, at one and a half volts, both the N channel and the P channel are both on. And so it will it will spike some current. Okay. So what happens here? All right, I get another spike. Okay. And sorry, I meant to draw this 50% duty cycle. I get another spike. So if you looked at the total, if you integrated I. All right. What you're going to do is basically have some constant times the frequency. Right. Frequency of this waveform. So if I double the frequency, I'll double the number of these pulses. Um, now, how could I reduce the size of the pulse? Well, I have a faster, I have a faster slew rate, right? Or I have some sort of cool gates that don't turn on, you know, maybe 1.8 and 1.5, don't turn them on, uh, whatever. So bus frequency, okay. Um, uh, passive components, you know, the, uh, you know, the resistors dissipate uh, power. So um, the, uh, here's the tr interesting trade-off in a, in a passive component. If I take two, uh, okay. Any questions on this? Because I'm going to erase it and do, it and do another one. So if you looked at the behavior of this uh, input output circuit, right? They have, if this is the input and that's the output, the input and the output, they have basically the same theoretical, um, the theoretical uh, performance, but you might imagine that this is lower power. But what's your trade off? What are you what are you giving up? Low impedance. Yeah, the imp the the drive. If you again, if you if you think of the output as um as a seven and equivalent, this is a three hundred two question, by the way. If you think of the out, this is the output over here, obviously. If you think of the output as a seven and equivalent um, uh, circuit, it's got a voltage, open circuit voltage and a short circuit current. 
and that R is the same as this R, okay? Uh, so your drive current is better here. There's one more thing that's better on this side, and that is noise. This is noisier. All right. Um, batteries do leak on their own. Um, we're going to talk about the regulator in a moment, but you can lose power in the regulator. And when they say actuator power, I think they probably means replacing one solenoid with another solenoid or replacing one electromagnetic. A, for instance, the solid state relays, uh, since you're driving an LED, require a lot less power than an electromagnetic relay. Those are actuator things. So let's talk about software. What am I going to do with my software? And that is, I'm going to go into sleep mode. Um, uh, this is a cool. Um, this is a cool. This is a obviously a picture out of the book. Uh, this is a cool thing. It's not quite the same as the one in the kit. Um, the one in the kit is a sensor tag, but it's. Uh, uh, it's a 1352R sensor tag, uh, and rather than redraw the pictures, I just um, I just uh, you know stole the pictures out of the book uh, with permission, of course. Okay, um, and that is uh, this is an integrated system. There's a uh, a, a Wi-Fi chip. I mean a, a, a wireless chip um, surrounded by a bunch of peripherals. Okay, so. Um, both this one, I actually have some of these if you want to use a 2650, but in checkout are these uh, sensor tags, the CC1352s. Uh, I bring it up now because we're, we're going to see the 2650 when we get the Bluetooth, because that is one of the Bluetooth options. Uh, and uh, this is the 2650 block diagram. Uh, it's an interesting... Um, an interesting um, uh, architecture because uh, count the number of processors on this chip. You see them? How many microcontrollers on a 2650? Two. Three. Where's the, see the third one? It's got a sensor controller as well. Now it's not a full programmable thing, but it's, it's, it, is, it is adjustable, okay? So if you remember uh, the, you know, the 2650 attached to the MSP432, making either the robot or the, or the fitness device, now you have four processors, okay? And why might you, why might you, Layer, okay, that's the answer to my question. Uh, this is a layered processor because the RF engine, if you'd like, uh, runs independent from the protocol engine. Okay, so the Bluetooth, the Bluetooth stack runs here. Ah, that's bad. The Bluetooth stack runs here. And the radio, the antenna blows here. And this is the data acquisition system. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So um, again, we're doing power. Okay. So the reason why I did this one because they did do a power analysis of this device, um, and like I said, it looks a little bit it looks a little bit like the other sensor tag. Uh, it goes down to 0.24. Um, milliamps in standby mode. Uh, if you run the controller, but not the sensors, you, you know, you can see that most of the, um, yeah, yeah, the, the microcontroller itself, the difference between these two is not that much. Uh, and so we're going to use the sensors and actuators in active mode here will uh, drive most of this current. Okay, uh, Bluetooth is a big one. Uh, what's the other one? The accelerometer is a big one. Um, and so this is an example of a sensor budget. Um, 
it's when I did the math on this, this is the number from the, this is the number from the book. Okay. And these are these numbers I got from the book. When I divide the two, I don't get 12 milliamps. Okay. Uh, I get closer to six milliamps. Why? How can the average current be six milliamps? Goes to sleep. Yeah, so it's it's oscillating between these two modes, right? Fifty percent duty cycle, whatever. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is a this is a device. Now I, I showed I showed one of the later embodiments. Um, this is one of the later embodiments uh, in the, one of the first few slides. The one that didn't have a battery. Uh, this is the precursor to that. It has a battery in it, and so this implant, which you can see, is about whatever three three and a half um, centimeters long is mostly battery, okay? Most of that volume there is battery. Uh, and it's an implant, um, but we did a power budget on it and that's why it's here. Again, its purpose was to measure pressure volume loops in the rat heart during drug studies, okay? Uh, and let's just like to show you some of the power saving um, capabilities. Uh, first of all, we chose a, um, we chose a, a low power device. Uh, do you remember? <clears throat> do you remember the sleep mode in the other one? Uh, 0.24 milliamps. Uh, <clears throat> look at this sleep mode. Uh, this thing <clears throat> um, gets very sleepy. Okay, uh, and um, I promise you, those are very hard currents to measure. I'm just warning you; those are very hard currents to measure. So we chose a processor that was low power. Uh, some of the other cool design tactics we did is we use low power analog circuits, right? These are low power op amps, but rather than power them off a, a regulator, we powered the analog circuits off a GPIO output port. This is a GPIO output. So when the mic, when, when we want to shut down, we want to go to sleep, uh, we can make this pin off, make it an input. No current flows into there. And these, so it's not even, it's, it, this current goes to zero when this thing goes to sleep because the voltage uh, again goes to zero. Okay? Um, so that was one of the tricks. Now, it's a little bit noisier, if you, you know, because we, we need the power supply rejection ratio to make this. Uh, but again, it's battery powered. Um, okay, so, and here's an actual current, um, current profile. And there's my current budget. If I take a, um, if I take a 130 uh, milliamp uh, lithium ion battery. So I take my, uh, I take my, um, uh, you know, my battery. Uh, this is just converting milliamps to microamps. I'm converting days to hours. I'm converting months to days. And there's my desired lifetime, five months. And now when I do that math, I need to run less than 36 microamps. But when I run the stupid machine, okay, uh, this is my, this guy down here is my 0 0.5 microamps, okay. It uh, turns on the microcontroller, uh, drives the sampling process, collects a piece of data running here at, at 14 milliamps. Uh, uh, this is a, a sub gigahertz, um, a sub gigahertz proprietary TI channel like that, like that uh, 15.4. Um, turned the Wi-Fi power down as low as we could and still have it generate outside the rat, but you can see that um, that it took 30 milliamps to transmit a packet. Uh, and then because it's bi-directional, because the, the, the system uh, uh, required it to receive packets, I mean to receive commands uh, back, 
we had to go through a um, a fairly long, and I don't believe I believe this is milliseconds, not seconds. I knew this typo. This is milliseconds. Sorry, it doesn't take that long. Uh, milliseconds, clearly. Um, uh, here it's waiting to receive a packet back from the from the base station and goes back to sleep again. Uh, so what two things can you say? Um, well, let's go. How do I solve my uh, how do I solve my um, my power budget? Don't transmit very often. Yeah, I guess this basically turns out to be one of these packets. Um, one of these packets you know like i forget what it was every two hours so you know it's uh, basically five milliseconds uh six milliseconds uh every two hours and that got this thing down to 36 microamps um this also allows me to tune right to tune what, what which which activity required the most amount of energy Peak or sustained? No, I, in this in this budget here, where am I spending most of my power? Doing what? Transmitting. No. The receive. I'm gonna receive. Actually, it takes more power to receive than it does to transmit. Right. The integral of that is the integral of this is bigger, right? Yeah. I there, you know, the, yeah. Right. Then than that one. So you got to ask the question, how important is it to receive back? Okay. You know, maybe once a day I'll receive something, right? You know, maybe I don't need, need to receive it every time. Um, uh, the bottom line is we did this budget. Uh, it lasted 42 days. When we got to the experiment, uh, because uh, this thing was not quite that low. Okay. <laughs> We measured these, so we were pretty sure about those. But obviously, uh, that thing was not didn't get down to uh, one and a half microamps. Is the specification of the microcontroller? We had some leaks somewhere. Uh, the other cool thing we learned is what happens when you catch a lithium battery on fire, and uh, you do that in on campus, and there's a lot of paperwork you have to fill out. So. Uh, we'll get to charging lithium ion lithium ion batteries uh, later. Okay, so uh, here's another. Uh, any questions on that? That was a fun project. Like I said, we got rid of the battery and harvested power. Uh, that really reduced the size of this uh, this implant a lot and weight. Um, this is an interesting. Uh, um, I don't know how true it is. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is, um, what are uh, what are some of the power requirements? Now, this is in watts to do certain things. Okay, uh, you know the RFID tag, you know, is on the order of microwatts. Uh, hearing aids are on the order of hundred microwatts. Um, why is the, the, some of the low power wireless devices are on the order of milliwatts? Uh, Bluetooth, GPS, cellular, laptops, desktops, you know, uh, you know, power tools, uh, more watts. Okay. So on one axis here is sort of the, um, the amount, the different applications uh, that require different amounts of power. So before you go to start harvesting power, I guess the point here is to figure out uh, uh, what, how much you need. Okay, that's the point of this, even if the numbers are all wrong. Um, not gonna talk much about solar or thermal. Uh, mostly because I don't really know how they work. Uh, but solar is good if you're outside, obviously. Um, thermal is okay if, you've, if you're an industrial plant and you're, you've got some sort of high temperature gradient built into the, into the system, you can harvest power from thermal. Uh, 
uh, we are going to talk about um, capacitors. Uh, uh, every other time I go down to uh, San Antonio to do one of our mouse or 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 pig studies, I see the group that's in there right before us uh, is building a um, pacemaker catheter wire, a catheter, a wire, you know, basically a tube. Um, and they're going to harvest it the, because the heart beats. Uh, they're going to harvest the energy off the beating wires. Um, and so, you know, a, 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 a you know, a, a, a watch that you can wear that shakes. Uh, if you could, you know, you put something on something that moves, that oscillates, uh, then you can use a piezo mechanical device. Uh, somewhere in there is a mass and a spring and a motion, but now you have a vibrating, you have piezoelectric elements where there is a direct relationship between charge and displacement, okay? Uh, and it essentially behaves like a capacitor, and as you oscillate those piezoelectric devices, you're going to get voltage, okay? And you can harvest that voltage. Um, uh, yeah, an interesting, uh, yeah, an interesting problem with the guys from Dartmouth that were doing this is uh, uh, their their difficulty was the whole thing clotted. <laughs> And it's the thing that was supposed to move stopped moving because it filled with blood and the blood clotted. So that was, that was their failure. Um, I'm going to do this in more detail when we get to the, the near field communication. Dr. Uh, Bobano. Yeah. Just to go back to the piezo. Um, okay, well, look, I'm sorry. I'm back. Uh, I'm listening again. Uh, now I see what time it is, too. So I'll go ahead and wrap up. Let's wait. Uh, for Stop, just how much energy can you typically get out of one of these? Oh, not devices? a lot, no. Um, uh, it all depends on how big it is, right? It all depends on how big it is. So uh, it has to move, it has to shake, uh, and a good answer, uh, uh, Austin, I do not know. Uh, I do not know, but I shall look it up and I'll stick it on this slide when I start. Uh, I will start, I will look, I will, yeah. Okay, no, it's gone. So right here, I will, I will give myself a note to look it up. I don't know. Uh, enough to run a pacemaker. Uh, that was much I know, but but then again, you've got a pretty hefty, you know, love dubbing going on inside the heart continuously. All right, I'm. Uh, it's um, yeah, it's after ten forty-five. Um, what's left? You know, there's a couple more in. Oh, I'm, I'm part way through this slide. If I, uh, yeah, so we're in pretty good shape. I will. Uh, um, I will go ahead and stop. Answer any questions. And we'll pick this up on Thursday when we repeat. Oh, while you're all here, um, let me announce again. Uh, and that is just an invitation to the class. Uh, Benjamin has already, I've already twisted his arm. If, if there's something in this field of IoT that you actually have a specific um, advantage with, I mean, uh, expertise with, I'm going to invite you to give a lecture. Uh, Ben's going to show us how to hack into a, uh, uh, into, to unsecure a, um, a, uh, okay, what, so remind me of Ben, what are you going to do? Uh, the Nordic NRF 52840. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's going to hack into it and show us the security leak. Yeah. So if there's something in the field of what you perceive this class might be talking about that you have an experience with, um yeah well, i'll invite you to i'll invite you to participate probably later in the you know you're, as part of the project you're all gonna give a presentation of your project but aside from your project i'll also invite you to come um yeah uh so lab lab checkouts have started any questions on anything
um, Rita, reach out to me about what you want me to do about lab one with you. I mean, I'm pretty flexible, but reach out. Um, oh, I'm, I'm going to be on campus on Friday, so I'll drop by and pick up a kit. Okay. Now, again, I will mail you stuff if you need me to. No, it's all good. Okay. I have to come anyway. Okay. So um, use the Google Doc to make sure it's there. Okay. And again, okay. if you're taking something, mark it on the Google Doc so people don't show up looking for it. Okay. Um, and if anybody okay. needs to be safe, I don't care. I, you know, it's not, this class is not that big. I can ship you stuff. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. So what was the, uh, what was the, what was the fundamental message of, um, yeah, let, let's do it two ways. What's the fundamental message that you got out of, uh, let's do them one at a time, um, the recent, out of the uh, 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 sensor integration. The most important thing you got out of this slide was what? Using create, there's different ways to fuse sensors to come to decisions. Yeah, and the difficulty is the units aren't the same. So you need a mathematical way to combine you know, oranges and apples. Okay. Um, okay. That was good. What's the other one that I said near the end? Requires tuning and intuition. Yeah. Intuition and tuning. Okay. Uh, don't be afraid to be the, the smart man in the room or woman in the room. Okay. Uh, let's see. What about the next one? What was the, what was the thing about actuators? The most important thing you got out of this slide deck was what? Try to get one with reference design. With yeah, the, buy one. Don't the sample. Yeah, buy one. You know, buy it. You know, don't. Uh, yeah, just like our software, we're going to we're going to. Yeah, and um, I'll, we'll talk more about what the most important stuff out of this one is. As we get further on, you can see I'm only on slide 2013. All right, so we'll see you on Thursday. Uh, reach out to me if there's anything I can do for you or explain. Um, okay. Bye.